Welcome everyone. My name is Legacy Russell and I'm the executive director and chief curator at The Kitchen here in New York City. It's my great pleasure to be here tonight in celebration of Mabel O. Wilson and Radcliffe Bailey for what is part of an ongoing bomb series titled Room with a View. But in an exciting new term, this room and this view tonight marks the kickoff of a new partnership between The Kitchen and Bomb Magazine in our ongoing collective celebration of The Kitchen's 50th anniversary and Bomb Magazine's 40th anniversary. The partnership will continue to unfold with a forthcoming series titled Across the Table. Across the Table, in the weeks ahead, will bring together The Kitchen and Bomb Magazine in critical dialogue and creative collaboration at the turning of anniversaries across both dynamic institutions. In a moment where models of care continue to be central to the ways the future of art can be imagined, The Kitchen and Bomb have teamed up to present a series of conversations via Instagram Live that invite two artists with distinct ways of making and thinking to share common ground. Bringing together folks who have never before been in public conversation with each other, Across the Table gives space to center the creative process as its own site of exploration ripe with mutual points of departure. I want to take a moment to extend special thanks to the inspired innovators across the kitchen and bomb who have brought this evening and the possibility of growing in this cross-institutional collaboration to the fore. Alison Burstein, Sienna Fiquette, Libby Flores, Raina Holmes, Bo Sa, and Isis Pinheiro, without whom this program would not be possible. So tonight is a diving in, a point of discovery, an ecstatic convening as we look toward this next horizon. As the program unfolds, we hope you'll join us in the championing of these two contributors to the next avant-garde alongside these two transformative institutions that in championing artists just keep showing us new visions for the future. So welcome and keep supporting Bomb and The Kitchen for more programming just like this one. We are so grateful to be in community with you. And now to turn to our evening. I have the honor of introducing our phenomenal speakers. Mabel O. Wilson teaches architecture and black studies at Columbia University, where she also serves as the director of the Institute for Research in African-American Studies. With her practice studio, she was a member of the design team that recently completed the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers at the University of Virginia. Wilson has authored Begin with the Past, Building the National Museum of African-American History and Culture in 2016, Negro Building, Black Americans in the World Affairs and Museums in 2012, and co-edited the volume Race and Modern Architecture from Enlightenment to Today in 2020. For the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, she was a co-curator of the exhibition Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America in 2021. Radcliffe Bailey is a painter, sculptor, and mixed media artist who utilizes the layering of imagery, culturally resonant materials, and text to explore themes of ancestry, race, migration, and collective memory. His work often incorporates found materials and objects from his past into textured compositions, including traditional African sculpture, tin types of his family members, ships, train tracks, and Georgia red clay. Often quilt-like and aesthetic, Bailey's practice creates links between diasporic histories and potential futures, investigating the evolution or stagnation of notions of identity. Please join me in welcoming Mabel and Radcliffe. Great. Thank you, Legacy, for that incredible introduction. Uh, I just want to thank Libby, um, Isis, Bo, <laughs> all of the folks, and there's a whole bunch of folks that made um, this possible. And it's really exciting to have Bomb and, and Kitchen together. And I just want to say hello to Radcliffe. Hey. Hey. <laughs> cool. So are you ready to um, start this? I think so. OK. I think I'm ready. Yeah, so this is this is an improv. <laughs> we'll see where it goes. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> but reading, it's funny because we're both from New Jersey um, and have migrated, lived all over the place. But, um, you know, family is really, really important. And I actually, you know, I've known your work for years and I probably never told you this, but actually 
Claude Simard, who you you know who who, who oh. Claude was amazing. I took my students to my design students, architectural design students, to Jack Shaneman, and he was going to show us work because we were looking at a museum of the diaspora, and and just Shaneman has amazing artists. And your work was actually in this, it wasn't on view, but it was it was sort of kind of out in that room on the lower level. And so he talked extensively about your work. So it was really nice to get that that conversation. So I knew that work, but also you are my cousin's neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that is also our connection, which is funny, you know, that it's both the work and also family. And so I just thought we could start out about, you know, kind of talking about how family impacted, I know there was an aunt of yours that was very important, but how you link family with art making and your practice. Well, um, it was always complicated because I never really like, I think when I was an art student, I didn't really know that I had family members that made art or was were interested in art. And I remember um, my mother, Having having a conversation with me about my aunt Corrine, and my aunt Corrine was the first person who basically took my mother to museums and stuff. And so, um, my great aunt, who who I was was pretty much somewhat close to, but she used to go to the Barnes Foundation, and she she knew a lot of she knew the wives, and so she was kind of connected. And she was like the person who introduced my mom to to art who my mom introduced me and that was uh that was profound but i really never really understood it until later on through college um and then later on i realized that i have other family members like i have a my mother's uncle um was friends with horace pippen in philadelphia and, and westchester and so they were friends based around the military. So I kind of like had these kind of relationships at a distance, but I didn't really, you know, I didn't really understand art or know much about art until I went to art school. I, th I feel like I did, but I didn't. Um, because then that's where I really started to investigate on who I was as an artist, who I was as a person and my DNA and my makeup and my family. And, and some of my first, uh, some of my early works were, you know, really making references to my grandmother who gave me a family album right before she died when I was in art school. And it was a bunch of tintypes. And so I started including that in my work. And part of it was really like, I wanted to make work where I could actually have conversation with my family members. The art world was a strange place to me because I didn't really know where I where I fit in. I didn't really, I felt like I was making this work that was personal to the point where why would someone take interest in that work? And it was just, a, it was a strange time. And this was like, probably like 91, or where really when I first started showing work. And I was curious um, about those tintypes, um, because I was looking at that work. Did your grandmother give you tintypes of family members? Well, that was our... she knew or she knew would be relatives or were friends because it's very difficult because I don't have any photographs of any of my relatives from the 19th century nothing you know barely have anything of my grandparents so that's quite unusual but but were they relatives of yours and if so did that impact how you thought about history your connect the memories of family um but also a kind of maybe a meditation which we'll talk about later about blackness and history Right. Uh, when the photographs were given to me, and this is right before she died, she just, uh, it was a Christmas, and I remember we were all kind of hanging out, I was hanging out with my aunts, and she went and grabbed this family album and brought it up to the front where we were sitting at this round table, and then she, I would sit at the table and doodle and make little small drawings, and she gave it to me, and I felt like oh man, my, my grandmother doesn't really know my artwork, but she gave me these photographs. And she mentioned like the ones that were family members. And those are the ones that I, I use, but I only use at certain moments. But this family photo album had a bunch of 10 types of family members and those that were connected to the family in different ways. But I did not know exactly those ways because of, a lot of that information she couldn't really, she didn't really know. 
but but she her um her father was a preacher and there was a congregation that was associated with her family and so there are some connections because those may have been like family members or friends or it may have been people who were a part of the congregation um so I choose to use the photographs of the ones that I know nothing about because I always felt like they were going to become discarded and they're going to show up on some antique road show or something. And I'm not going to really have any connection with them. So I choose to use those images and um, give them a presence within my work. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole history of kind of making do, certainly in Black communities, reusing you know, making do with what you have, you know, and, um, you know, that, you know, kind of comes into food and quilting and, you know, <laughs> I, you know, all of that stuff. Um, and, you know, I too had, you know, artistic family. One side of the family were, were chefs. The other side, you know, were incredibly creative, my grandmother. And, and so I had a couple of uncles who taught art. And another uncle um, is the artist John Outerbridge. I don't know if, mm. if Isis can pull that that up. And that for me was really important work to think about, especially as I was starting my um, studying architecture, particularly at the master's level, where, you know, it's a very Eurocentric and white discipline. And I, I needed to find the spaces of blackness that was very, very important. And I started to look at his work um, for that reason. And can I have the next please? You know, and just the way in which he uses found materials like this, a belt, you know, but also the kind of more abstract pieces of metal and the way he makes fasteners and, you know, and just narratives of migration and travel um, that are that are about his work. And I worked on a piece with a friend of mine who's an architect photographer, Peter Tolkien, and it was an essay called Catfish and Coltrane to kind of think more broadly kind of about how he kind of makes architecture in his studio space but it was an image of a of a um countertop and and it showed how found objects like a countertop this is something he, he salvaged had very similar details to a piece called in search of the missing mule so there was a direct way in which you know how he made space lived space the domestic routines and and that and 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 so you know, that kind of meditation on that practice within family became very important, um, certainly for my for my own practice and how I think about work. Um, but you also have looked at my uncle's work as well. Oh, yeah. And I've always been a big fan. And I was first introduced to his work by um, Ed Spriggs, who was once a director at Hammond, uh, Hammond's House and the Studio Museum in Harlem. And he uh, introduced me to his work and I was just blown away. And uh, I was, I don't know, I just, you know, thinking about West Coast artists and thinking about, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that's um, when I think about his work. And, you know, if I look at some of my earlier work, which, which are not in some of these slides, you'll see some references to his work as well. So yes, very familiar. Yeah, I mean, I think this is called case in point, packages travel like people, you know, and there's no question that diaspora, you know, is something to think about and important um, uh, in the work of, of many um, uh, black artists. Can, I, can we have that next slide? Um, and so I just want to maybe talk about the door of no return and thinking about Dion Brand um, and her book, A Map to the Door of No Return, you know, which you know, just had its 20th um, anniversary. And Dion writes, I think really beautiful, beautifully. And this is a quote, um, to have one's belonging lodged in a metaphor, in voluptuous intrigue, to inhabit a trope, to be a kind of fiction, to live in the black diaspora is I think to live as a fiction, a creation of empires and also of self-creation. It is to be a being living inside and outside of herself. And so I thought, you know, it'd be great to talk about like how does one make art in the space of diaspora? Hmm. Wow. Well, 
uh, when I think about this piece, uh, well, I, I'll just start from this piece in general, like the door to return. It was really, for me, it was, it was like some questions that were, you know, I was really asking a lot of questions in terms of just trying to figure out our makeup. Like we think about like an African-American artist in the, in, throughout history, only until recently we discovered, uh, there was discovery as this thing about understanding DNA. And I, and I, yeah, I did my DNA and traced my DNA back on my mother's side, Sierra Leone and Guinea. And, you know, it answers some questions because I've always tried to figure out a reference point when it came to making work when I was in school, because I never, it was always like, you know, I'm reading a lot, picking up a lot of information in school. I'm learning art history, but I'm also like, there's not much about me. There's not much about me at all. So where do I reach? And so then I started saying, well, I reach closer, closest to me and which were my family members, but also the other reach was um, Southern parts of the United States thing, dealing with like the slave trade and the different places where we've come through. And so that was always like a starting point, but it was also like, you know, there were shows in museums where you would see shows about African art, but especially like West Africa and Congo. And so those were like entry points and thinking about in terms of that African art and how it's kind of crossed the Atlantic and has done so many things. It's been taken and it's been brought and then all of a sudden it shows up in a museum and it affects uh, that child that may have come in on a Saturday or like a field trip from a high school. And I was like that kid who kind of, you know, observed African art from that, from that point. But I don't really think about it as, I think I give a lot of power to the objects themselves because I felt like it, it did its thing. Even though it's been through a lot, it did its thing. It's almost like our practices in terms of music and art and the things that we make and the quilt making and all those things, and they still exist and they still have purpose and they function. And I think some of the functions of the objects went beyond the functions of what they what they were doing on the continent. They tr they still are active today. Um, that's kind of my attitude towards uh, when I think about you know your question. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I what I like about your work, and especially the the last show, the recent show you had at Jack uh, Shaman's, um, it, especially you know there there are these kind of spaces that are almost like you're in the hull of a ship, or that sense of being in that space, and you know so many motifs in your your work are these vessels, right? That are you know that are carrying both the body, right, um, but also kind of a psychological space, right? And I'm, and I'm really, you know, a lot, of my, a lot of my work is about healing. It's not necessarily about uh, um, expressing that pain. I mean, I make art and I want to make beautiful things. I don't want my art to kind of bring me into a uh, reenactment. I don't want to make a reenactment. I want to um, push myself towards the future. I want to be in a like a very healthy healing space. I think that some people can do it and they have the abilities to do that and go within that space. But for me personally, I can't go within that space. Even though I may deal with a time period, I'm still my brain somewhere else beyond that time period. It's really like a little note. It's like a small part of the work, but it's there's another part of the work that's really about beauty. You know, kind of finding beauty in the everyday um, is very important also, I think, for a kind of a psychological sense um, of, um, I wouldn't just say survival, but persistence, um, refusal, resistance, right, of, of creating um, possibilities, right? And some people would say, um, you know, making a way out of no way. Right. 
um, you know, is definitely, it is definitely kind of a challenge to do that. And I know, you know, at UVA, it was really tough because, you know, our historians told us, you know, we estimate there are about 4,000 people who lived and worked here. They weren't all owned by the university. Um, many of them, oddly enough, were rented from local plantations. Some were owned by professors, um, but we had almost nothing. We had no names, but what we heard um, from the community and especially from the descendant community that was emerging as we were doing this project was to, um, um, to name names. But how do you do that when you don't know, right? And so we really had to, create a way of marking their presence, which we do kind of marking them on the surface, you know, and these kinds of, we call them memory marks, but these kinds of gashes, which are kind of like the, um, you know, the, the labor, right, of the stonemason, for instance. Right. And yeah, like here, um, but cool. also the way in which we, the names we didn't know, we gave them kinship relations, like seeing here grandmother or son or friend, or we talked, you know, we labeled the work they did, like woodcutter, um, seamstress. There's a one fiddler actually on the entire memorial, and you know, we tried to kind of think about how do we how to humanize essentially, and not show them on a ledger, but actually show them as a community, a kind of genealogical cloud of relationships. So, you know, I understand exactly like how do you turn that trauma into something that is actually creative and productive, right? Right. Right. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the which helped me a lot was it wasn't like it wasn't my choice, but I remember whenever I would make work, my mother would come over right before the work is being sent away, and she would just tell me how she felt, and wow. right did it right then and there. I was like, okay, I have to like have the sensibility. I have to understand my mother. I mm -hmm. have to understand her sensibilities and, yeah. you know, and allow that to exist. Just like my grandmother gave me the family album. I have to take that same kind of, you know, respect and honor and, yeah. So, and there was another thing. I mean, my, my grandfather and my grandparents live right, um, not far from Charlottesville. And they lived in a oh. town called Palmyra and they live like close to this area called Zion Crossroads. And I just mm -hmm. remember as a kid, I spent summers there and my grandfather actually worked at Monticello and he, he would wow. sometimes give tours and talk about why the clock was in the floor. But there was also different parts of um, the grounds. As a kid, I remember uh, visiting in those different parts, that kitchen down below in the back to I remember they had a place where they back in the woods where they were doing frescoes. Mm. They they were doing all kinds of different things. But there was also, you know, there are a lot of things that the Africans have basically brought to um, Thomas Jefferson and those were things that they really knew and they understood. Um, so I and I know that that whole story is very complex and complicated. And uh, yeah, so I, I think about all those kind of historical spots. And it's funny, I think about the trauma, but I also think about black creativity that happened within those spaces. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right about, you know, the incredible knowledge that people had, um, you know, about literally how to make food, how to construct things, how to, you know, and, and, you know, that is the labor, you know, that, that built this country that is completely unacknowledged uh, right. in a way. I was reading, if you, there's this, Dana Milbank has this um, opinion today in the Washington Post about a history book in Virginia that basically said that black folks were, they loved their masters and, you know, <laughs> the masters gave them love and support. Like, this is literally in and I'm just like, I, I, you, you have got to be kidding me. Like, we cannot <laughs> allow that lie to be told. And yet here it is, right? Yeah. An inability to, you know, kind of accept the truth. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that is the kind of public discourse. That is the problem of the American public discourse and the way in which it has crafted public spaces, mm -hmm. right? In which the telling of this American history, which is black history, um, 
is challenging. It's challenging. Like we see, you know, we saw all these Confederate, <laughs> not all of them, but a, a small percentage of them come down um, in this country. But the one in Richmond, that pff, Monument Avenue was a major one, right? Um, and so that really does challenge public space. And I know that you've been doing work, um, public work in um, Madison, Wisconsin and Greensboro. And I'd love to hear more and for you to share, you know, with um, the folks in the audience about how you think about those spaces. What, what's, what are the projects uh, there? And I don't know if there are slides that we have, but perhaps um, we, we You know, it's funny you're talking about it. Uh, we refer to it as like, uh, oh, me and okay. some friends, we refer to as like black mystery because there's always <laughs> a mystery about actually, you know, especially this month, but there's always a mystery uh, in terms of what we've done. And I'm always, I'm not surprised, but we're all, there's always, hopefully, there's all, there's more information that comes out about some of the things that we've done. And, but, you know, it doesn't surprise us, but it's just like, really? <laughs> mm. So, so this, um, this is kind of a detail of a sculpture. It's about 30 feet tall. And you don't really see the whole grounds of it. But this is in Greensboro, uh, North Carolina. And I was commissioned to do this piece. And it's, um, it's being worked on right now. So it should go up pretty soon. But it's um, across the street from a house called the Magnolia House. And the Magnolia House is part of the Green Book. and um, the whole subject of the piece that I'm doing is based on freedom. And so what, what you have is a sculpture here, which is a railroad track that goes up in the sky and there's a, um, a star on it really dealing with the North Star. And the bottom of the piece itself is all cast concrete in the shape of like a boat, almost like as if you were around the bottom of a, a boat that was dry docked. And there's some reference to boats and ships and uh, the railroad. My father, my father's side of the family was a part of the Underground Railroad. But then also there's another layer to it. My father was actually a railroad engineer. And so he would um, go up and down the lines. And as a kid, we used to catch a train called the Southern Crescent. And we would always go visit our family members from Atlanta and go straight up to um, DC, Philadelphia, Jersey. And so we would catch that train, but my dad had a lot of friends who worked on the train. So I had a whole different perspective of when I would catch the train and visit my dad's friends who were, uh, who were working on the train, who worked in the diner car and some of those stories and some of those thoughts. But we would also, the time of day that we would travel would be like, I think the train would leave at like seven at night. And so somewhere around, I don't know, around two or three, we were like in the um, Carolinas. And so what I wanted to do, and I had this thought about like thinking about those routes that went for the Southern Crescent to go up North, but thinking about those who were escaping and running away during the Underground Railroad. So there's a parallel between the two. And so there's a walkway in between the piece itself that's in a Y shape. And the Y shape is really based around the Dogon ladder. And, it's, and I'm making references, you know, to African references, but I'm also taking that idea of that Dogon ladder that reached up to a granary, but then also like looking at the railroad track as if it was a ladder. And so I'm kind of playing with the two of those and then the location of that Magnolia house and um, also dealing with the sit-ins in Greensboro. So it's a combination of a lot of thoughts that are kind of layered on top of each other. And it's kind of like back when you were talking about how do I deal with those subject matters. Um, I, a lot of it's really based on over layer, layer and layer over top of layer. And I have this thing where I don't know when to stop. So I always stop on the seventh layer. And sometimes that seven layers, seven layers of thought. Yeah, no, this is a really, is this, this is a model or is this the piece itself? This is a model. The actual okay. piece <laughs> is gonna be that, um, that image is the con a concrete basis, 10 mm -hmm. feet tall. 
and the railroad track itself is 20 feet tall. And on the right hand side of it, there's a neon star, which is mm -hmm. North Star. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which was the sign of freedom, even though, as we know, up north wasn't necessarily freedom, was it just uh -uh. a different, different brand? <laughs> <laughs> Good one, different brand. I like a different that. brand of, of racism. Mm -hmm. Um, but before we go into the Q&A, and I do see that there are some um, questions in that, I you know, just wanted to talk about Atlanta um, a little bit um, and, uh, you know, that, that um, you know, black folks have contributed to the rich histories of American cities um, and enslaved and freed black people have been a part of Atlanta's history since its founding on indigenous land when it was terminus, right, which is essentially right. a railroad. It was a railroad um, hub. Um, and now it's become, you know, the nation's sort of black Mecca. And yet, you know, it does have a history of being a segregated city, which is really a kind of 20th century product. Um, and now there are parts of the city that are undergoing um, gentrification in relationship to the ways in which the city has been separated. And this is Atlanta's Berlin Wall, which is kind of <laughs> in your and my cousin's neighborhood. So do you want to talk right. a little bit about <laughs> this history, oh, which man. I always thought was, was insane. Well, and not that, not that old. This is recent, fairly recent, certainly. Right. This was like yeah. 62, 63. Yeah. It, it was yeah. put up in 62 and it was being taken down in 63. And wow, and you have African American workers putting up the wall. <laughs> well, I will. Um, there was one thing I was, start, I was thinking about when you're talking about the history, and you were talking about terminus. And you're talking about and uh, thinking, like, take for instance, if you go to Atlanta right now and you go to downtown Atlanta, um, there's Five Points train station. There's a Five Points train station. And basically that's where, tr where the trains used to come in through and it was underground, they call it underground Atlanta. And basically where you go out right now in the public transportation, there's a martyr train station, you know, just like city trains. And uh, basically when you go out right there, that's right there on that same street within that block was where um, enslaved Africans were sold on that same street. And so, you know, we have a history in Atlanta of um, a lot of our history. We're, we're a city that's um, always building. We're always building or always tearing down things. Uh, maybe we can trace it back to the Civil War, the city being burnt down. Um, there's a lot of our history that, you know, here that kind of comes and goes, and I understand it. Um, and it's also strange. I live in, an, um, I live in Southwest Atlanta, right off of Cascade Road. And within that area of five mile radius is probably, we have like five or six mayors, African-American mayors who've lived within this community. That wall was put up in the neighborhood that's close by. It's literally like, you know, less than a mile away. And to think about that, and some of those histories, you know, of course, people don't want to bring them up and talk about them, but they exist. And to think about where we are today and the community itself, the community has always been fighting hard to hold its own in terms of its own history and understanding it, you know, existing you know i think about certain things i you know I, i'm rambling a little but i think about certain things when i jumped on the plane recently and i took off and i could see my neighborhood but i can also to see the city and i can see the way the city grew and i could see its history uh, in terms of the buildings and i think about like oh all the buildings go north all the skyscrapers go north. Okay, mm, that's interesting. And all this was based on segregation. And it's, it's, it's a strange thing to go through and understand those histories and, and look at it at what another layer is like, okay, here's this neighborhood I grew up in. It's historically African-American neighborhood, uh, integrated 
at a certain time. My parents moved to Atlanta in like 1972. And so when they moved to Atlanta, I was four. So I've kind of, I've been kind of sheltered in the neighborhood with a lot of love and a lot of understanding. I was familiar with African-American politicians and and doctors and lawyers, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, Land University. I, you know, grew up in this kind of, this nest. I went to Benjamin Mays High School. Benjamin Mays was once um, over Morehouse College. And so I, it's a lot of things that are going on. And then I also think about when my parents moved to Atlanta and they um, were at a Pascal's hotel. And I remember uh, my mom told me a story how this older gentleman came to them and walked up to him, walked up to them because they pulled out a map and they wanted to kind of understand what the city was about. And this older gentleman was a teacher of Dr. King. His name was Reverend Tobin. And he back then he was like in his 80s. And he showed my mother and father the city. And then that's what made my mother and father move to Atlanta. Um, so I've seen it from, from those perspectives, a lot of love. I'm, I've been up and down these streets as a kid. And it's, um, it's past histories are there. Um, take for instance, like I'm doing this public sculpture right now that's in a nature preserve that's in my backyard. And the nature preserve was a, um, was a part of the Civil War, and it was called the Battle of Utoit Creek. So you have those Civil War histories, but then there's also, there's histories of Native Americans that existed here too. And there's a lot of information and things that are layered on top of the history here. Um, so when I think about civil wars, I think about civil rights movement. I think about, you know, all those. And I think about people who've integrated the University of Georgia from Hamilton Homes. I think about, um, just a combination of things at once, all the mayors that are close by. And it's a, it's a beautiful environment, but it's also, um, you know, it's a complicated one, complex. Um, I think about the sculpture right now that I'm doing in the nature preserve, which is a sculpture that's based around, I was trying to create somewhat of like, a, I don't know, we have a slide of that, I think. I think it's okay. the next. Yeah. It's still, and when you see it, it's still, it's still in progress. I mean, it's still working. I'm still working it out now. I'm doing the grounds of it, but it's a concrete structure that's meant to be more like a, um, that's it. It's meant to be more like an amphitheater. And it's really to celebrate uh, Atlanta's history with music. Uh, one of those things that we don't have, like a lot of other cities have, we don't have a good jazz club. <laughs> we don't have a place where we can perform. We have festivals that happen. And so the piece was inspired when I was a kid and I remember going to, I don't know if it was some type of rally that dealt with Maynard Jackson at the time, but uh, there was, the city had these mobile stages where they would pull out these mobile stages and they would open up and there would be a concert. And, and so I wanted to create something that was a little more permanent where people could just kind of go and, you know, deal with that. But then also like, I'm thinking about it layered because the same space is where a civil war happened. But it's also like a place where we need to have conversations um, about, the, about the community itself. And so I wanted to create a piece that was based on that. And I have it so that I can have like performers or uh, different actors or poets or musicians can perform within that space. And it's, it's different from some of my other work, but I've always been interested in architecture and there is a reference to like, you know, to quilt making, to G's Ben. There was a, um, yeah, it's a lot of little parts of it, you know, there. But. Yeah, no, with that, I'm just gonna maybe, cause there's a question um, from uh, Kavita that actually is connected to that. And she asked, or they asked, I love how formal elements of jazz music like improv figure into your work. What about the space of jazz or music club? Do you have a favorite spot that inspires you 
or shows up in your work. I find it shocking, but I guess that's true. Atlanta doesn't have a jazz club. <laughs> yeah, it's complicated. I mean, it shows up, at, the music shows up in my work. The music has always been a glue to my work. Um, I like all kinds of music, but particularly like jazz. Um, it's more like something that's, you know, it's very much like, I've always been trying to figure out that reference to Africa within my own work. Um, I think a lot of Afri a lot of us try to figure that out, out, those connections. And I think that Africa is kind of within me or within we in terms of jazz music. So that's that's really where I'm coming from. It feels like, you know, when I think about jazz music, I think about African art and it trans transforming and doing something totally different today. And so that's where it shows up to me. Thank you, Kavita. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna, there's a question, I'll, I'll go to the top one by, um, from Tony, and Tony asks, you work in a lot of different mediums and materials. Do the materials come first, and then you find an idea to amplify the materials, or does the idea come first, and then you find materials to express your idea? Some of this and some of that, and a little bit of both. <laughs> So that's it. <laughs> yep, that's it. No, but I like, uh, you know, I think that the materials, uh, I mean, I'm a little bit of a hoarder and I'm kind of like this guy who just goes to antique shops and looks at stuff and finds things here, there and everywhere. And I just kind of incorporate. I, li I think a lot of artists do that. I'm pretty sure uh, Mr. Outbridge would do that. I'm pretty sure that those materials, you know, they kind of have a, uh, they get to you. And, and then when you own them, you kind of create a certain patina on it. And then that starts to do its own thing. Um, that's what I think. No, that's exactly what my uncle said. That's in our, our conversation with him, Catfish and Coltrane. He talks about going to thrift shops and junk shops and he says i'll find a rag and it'll, it'll just speak it has you didn't i don't know if he said patina but he said something very similar about like what it tells me about some place someone or somewhere um and so uh, yeah and i think that's true i think that's absolutely right um and so it kind of brings in a layer into the work that's actually um i don't know that's good that, that can complicate it uh, right. in a very interesting way um um Let's see. Um, uh, Catherine asks, I believe dreams have a significance in our lives. What is your thought on that aspect? Yeah, dreams are very important. I think, I think that the work, I, I think a lot of my work is really, I'm trying to, um, put dreams to paper it's funny it's like you can't really take a photograph of somebody and really capture them it's almost like well i said photograph i'm just thinking about like you know taking a paintbrush and a, or materials or making sculpture or making things you can't really capture that moment as much as you it's almost like you get a little bit of a sound, you get a little bit of the taste, you get a little bit of something with it, but you really truly can't capture it. And dreams are very complicated. And I think sometimes I make these references to um, Surreal is Real to Black people because I feel like through some of those dreams, we're kind of like trying to weave it all back together where it's like our lives are very fragmented. And I think about that sometimes when I look at like someone like Romare Bearden's work. You know, I think of, uh, I see these patches and these images from um, different places. And, you know, and then we take like, we'll take, I, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, we'll take like these, these instruments and we'll create this whole new music from where these instruments began, you know what I mean? And, and some of the history about those instruments may have began closer to home than we think. Um, so there's a lot of that that's kind of 
that's how I deal with dreams. <laughs> that's a great, um, yeah, that's a, that's a really, really great answer. Um, but on Bearden, um, Deirdre asks, are you influenced by Bearden's railroad tracks? Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. And, um, yeah, I've always been influenced by uh, most of the artists that have come before me before I was born, you know, but the artists who've been doing it for years. So those are like, you know, I take, of course, I, um, those are, he's like definitely a big influence to me in terms of my work. Um, and all his histories too. I mean, you know, he played baseball. He made a choice to, to be an artist. And I think about myself in terms of um, some of my choices to be an artist and to go in this direction, as opposed to going after some hoop dream of trying to play a sport, you know. Um, but I, um, yes, railroad tracks. <laughs> Let me get back on subject. <laughs> no, that that's really great, and I'm I'm so glad that question was asked. So I think that's going to be the last question. So because I'm getting a note that we have to wrap wrap yes. up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is our work. <laughs> Thank you both so much. This is such a delight. And I just want to mention to our wonderful warm crowd tonight, we had so many folks in the audience. If you didn't get your question answered, I'm so sorry. I hate I hate when that happens, but that just means we have a lot, uh, we had a lot to cover. And um, you both, it was such a delight, and it was such a delight to have uh, the view of the work and the dialogue, which we've been looking forward to so much. So my, my greatest appreciation for both of you. Thank you to the kitchen. Um, Isis will be dropping in some links for you to kind of follow up. We'll follow up via email. And, uh, and thank you, Isis, for running back in tonight. And thank you both. We really appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. no, thank you. This is great. Thanks, Radcliffe. Thank you. Be well. <laughs> you Be too. well, yes. <laughs>